I, I want to come back here to this question of deleveraging that a couple of you have mentioned. I mean, we saw in compiling our top 1,000 rankings this year, you know, the, the asset base of the top 1,000 fell by about a trillion dollars for the first time in, you know, pretty much the 40 years the rankings have been running. Um, and I think it's something David Soans mentioned at the beginning there, that banks just having to rein in lending because funding is constricted. Obviously, at the moment, loan demand isn't that great either. Companies are cautious about their investment. Households are, are saving more. Are we looking at a situation where potentially, if the real economy did start to recover, that's almost a greater strain on the banking sector in terms of being able to cope with it? Or does that automatically correlate to you know, a well, recovery right. in, in the banking funding environment I, as well? I, I think that's, that's a perfect segue into the, the regulatory discussion we have, um, that we're going to have, because you know, politicians um, and indeed regulators are really caught between a rock and a hard place at the moment, between you know, ensuring that the, the system is sufficiently robust, quote unquote, safe in terms of quantum and quality of capital, um, guidelines around liquidity requirements so that they that you know we're fully insulated against the tail risk events that we've lived through and that they're not going to bluntly have to write another check to bail out the banking system at the same time the cost of doing that is clearly and in you know, the IIF I think came out with um, you know the most dramatic of the uh, of the analysis where you know it, the cost of implementation in Europe over the next three years is three percent of GDP that's quite a high insurance premium to pay if at the same time we're under you know, severe stress in terms of making sure that, that growth continues. So finding mechanisms, finding a balance between those two opposing principles um, is going to be you know, the key, I think, um, for banks, for politicians, and for the banks that are owned by the politicians over the next few years. There's a, there's a philosophical question that's yet to be answered. There's a group of people, you could summarise them as central bankers, who want to make sure that banks have sufficient capital and funding, that nothing can break them down, bring them down again. And there's another group of people, let's characterise them as governments, want to make sure this can never happen again. And so if you prohibit activity and you restrict activity in order to make sure it never happens again, well, presumably you then don't need the capital, uh, that if it does happen again, would protect you. But that, 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 that debate hasn't been crossed. And really why, why we're in this, this spot is the market's the market, but also the banks are being asked to layer on all of these additional costs, all of these additional capital uh, restrictions and, and operational restrictions. And, and I think somebody needs to take the leadership and say, actually, what we, what we really want to do is, is either make sure it never happens again or, or accept that it probably will, that we've got the capital to cope with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I, I mean, uh, at the end of the day, I think the question is deleveraging, and that's fine, yeah, but I mean, I think what we currently observe is that uh, uh, while all the, those, this debt is going elsewhere, and it's not really disappearing from one day on the other, uh, and uh, uh, so, okay, banks maybe shrink down their balance sheet if they can, yeah, to some extent, which is already difficult, but there still is somewhere, uh, are those assets, right? Uh, um, so. Uh, and I think, indeed, I mean, the, the long-term solution is going to be, well, there's going to be less growth, obviously, yeah, to, to, to get this down. And, and, and somewhere there has to be uh, found a, a way uh, that, that the banking industry can survive, yeah, and, and being uh, beneficial for the, uh, uh, for the system, right? Um, and coming back, I mean, to the, to the bank funding, obviously, uh, yeah, I mean, okay, lending is one, is, is one side. Of course, you, you, you slow this down. I mean, that is, that is pretty obvious, if, if you can. I mean, there are some countries where you also have the regulators telling you, uh, please continue to lend, otherwise uh, you're going to be in trouble, right? Uh, so, uh, again, another dimension, yeah, where uh, pressure is put on banks. And, uh, uh, well, on the funding side, obviously, you try to get the money as you can, right? And, and, and uh, indeed, use every window you can with every instrument you can. And I guess, I mean, the other element that we sort of haven't gone into in detail is obviously the role that central banks are playing in providing liquidity. And in particular, obviously, at the moment, the European Central Bank is going through a sort of transition where we've got rid of the one-year lending, but we've got three-year lending. Um, they're now buying sovereign bonds, but they're sterilizing it with a one-week facility. I mean. Where does this leave us? How, how much of a contribution it's, it's is this It's interesting. You, know, you say that the top thousand banks have lost a trillion dollars of assets, but I assume the central banks have more than taken on more than a trillion dollars of assets. So the assets, as you're saying, have not gone away. The deleveraging hasn't occurred. And of course, deleveraging 
I mean, if you believe asset prices are a function of the leverage in the system, then if there is deleveraging, asset prices are going to come down. If asset prices come down, solvency comes down. So, I mean, it's a very fine line between, uh, between deleveraging and removing the funding problem and just creating a solvency problem. Uh, the only thing that solves it, I guess, is a bit of economic growth, whatever that is, uh, and a bit of time. And I think low rates has a decent chance of creating some of those, uh, some of those atmospherics which can allow for, uh, for, for, some, for some proper uh, growth in capital to allow for the deleveraging to occur. Just finally touching on that question of uh, central bank support, Mark, is it now less essential for banks? Are we again looking at a situation where certain banks are going to need it more and that sort of split between the haves and have-nots is going to appear? And, and what, what will happen with these support schemes, some of them due to come phase out at the end of 2010 and so on? Well, I wish I had a magic bullet answer to the latter part of the question, but to come back to the first part of the question, I do think there's truth in, in, in your opening comment about, well, will it again be the haves and the have-nots? Uh, and I suspect it is coming down to that. And, and the, you know, central banks are very good at making sure that no one knows too much about exactly who is going to the central bank and who is not. Uh, but we all know the macro figures, and um, I think the figures speak for themselves. I mean, a, a trillion deleveraged out of the system, um, for sure, that the central banks have taken on much, much more than that. Um, and um, to come back, I think it was David Marks who made the opening co comments. Um, if you can't access the public markets these days, and not many institutions away from the national champion banks in the right countries can, then this is a natural source of liquidity, and possibly one of the very few ones that you can access. So, yes, indeed, I do think that central banks' liquidity for now is very important to keep the system running. Uh, as to the latter part, uh, you know, what's the ultimate solution to get out of this? Uh, I, other than time, which has already been alluded to a number of times, uh, I'm not sure that there's an obvious one immediately. I mean, I think there are some, some grounds for optimism. If we looked at um, you know, the, the, the recent rollover of the one-year repo, which was, what, $443 billion, I mean, 240 of that... Um, obviously went into one week, but then clearly just under 200 um, wasn't rolled over. So that, there was a degree of, of reduction on reliance on the ECB by the European banking system um, that was, you know, obviously taken very well by the market. Key question is, you know, the financial apartheid, I love that phrase, David, thank you, um, that exists now. I mean, obviously for many of the, the peripheral, peripheral banks, you know, they'll continue to be increasingly reliant um, because their alternatives don't exist at the moment. So for the, the, the winners of the system, the national champions in the rest of Europe, they're the ones that can step back from central banks. But the, um, the dichotomy between those two is, you know, has never been stronger. Mm. And Ralph, obviously the, the ECB uh, ended its cover bond purchasing scheme as the market kind of moved on from that, that, that was, uh, mm -hmm. hasn't had a major impact, so there's one market. Yeah, yeah, I mean, is, the, is the first reflex could be, I mean, uh, the party's over, yes, but uh, uh, it turned out that, uh, indeed, I mean, there was a smooth uh, uh, now a transition into the, uh, let's say, new world, and we've already seen transaction uh, here uh, this week um, um, without support from the ECB whatsoever. Um, yeah, I mean, it was, uh, it was a, a good program at the right time, I think, to kick off the market. Uh, um, again, now, I mean, we have a broader asset buying program as well, right? So in case, uh, and clearly the program now comes from the sovereign. So, I mean, the asset purchase program of the ECB to buy a sovereign debt uh, well, should somehow help uh, all market segments, right? Uh, uh, to get maybe uh, somehow a bit uh, uh, the, the um, volatility down, yeah, and maybe uh, open the issuance window again broader. Uh, so yeah, the covered bond market does not need this uh, explicitly now, the support from the central bank. Um, it was useful um, over the last 12 months. So let's hope we can sort out the other problems with the sovereigns now. And then uh, I think the, the covered bond market will be basically just a, a function of that. And, uh, and will also open for those uh, market segments uh, that are currently not able to, to go there, yeah? like, uh, like uh, Spain or, uh, or Ireland, Portugal. Yeah?